Hi everyone, thank you for joining us in the first episode of Tech Away in 2021. In this series, you will hear topical discussions among tech experts across various domains at the Government Technology Agency of Singapore, or GovTech in short. So I'm Justice, and for this episode, we'll be talking about blockchain for the next 30 minutes. And we'll be talking with these two blockchain experts whom I worked with while I was an intern in GovTech. So I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Ray Jie, or you know, many people call me RJ because it's uh, easier, shorter. All right. And um, I've been at GovTech for coming to four years now. I've been working with Steven since then. And uh, what do I do at GovTech? I am a software developer, really. I, I just call myself software developer. There's a bunch of stuff that I do, but that, that, that's my uh, designation, software engineer. Uh, I'm on this team that deals with strange and wonderful cryptography stuff. Uh, it's called, we call ourselves a DLT, Distributed Ledger Technology Team. It's this team that uh, Steven started when uh, we started dabbling with these things. So, what do we do on this team? Mm, blockchain stuff. <laughs> Hi, Steven. Yeah, so we are a team of engineers, designers in GDS, Government Digital Services in GovTech. And we develop uh, digital services that is used by citizens as well as businesses. Uh, apart from developing digital services, we also uh, focus a lot more on uh, cutting-edge technology, like something like blockchain as one of them. Um, and you may have heard of uh, some of our products that we develop using blockchain technology, such as OpenCerts, Trade Trust, uh, and recently HealthCerts as well. Um, yeah, so, so far so good. Everything has been great. So if you're interested to join us, please let us know. So to break the ice with the audience, how about, RJ, let me, let's, uh, what's the interesting fact about yourself? They would like to share. Interesting fact about myself. I'm 162 cm short. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not very interesting. I have a cute dog. Is Ooh. that interesting enough? Yeah. So, so RJ is a cute dog. Um, I, I went to his uh, house to visit his, to play with his dog once. And uh, yeah, he's quite friendly. I think RJ brings the dog for a walk daily. Yeah, I mean, yes. it's what you have to do with the dog. I, I have a cute dog. I used to have a cat. I used to. And then she ran away with my mom. Oh, <laughs> that's tough. That's tough. How about Steven? Oh, um, quite a few things. So maybe I can talk about uh, one of my hobby. I like to exercise quite a bit, especially past one year um, since the COVID started. Uh, you know, then most of the time we work from home, then I, I, I realized, that, you know, I can use the time to exercise. So I exercise like uh, five or six times a week. Uh, and uh, I've been working on my handstand push-up. I still need a wall, just in case, you know, because, yeah, dangerous, yeah. So I, need, I do need a wall to lean on. Yeah, so pretty good. I can do about maybe 10 plus handstand push-up. It's about as many normal push-ups as I can do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apart from that, uh, I also like to uh, jog, so I jog every week. And then uh, these days, I'm trying one, uh, one arm pull-up. It's very difficult. Yeah, but just started. Uh, so if you're planning to get some exercise tips, you can get them from <laughs> Steven. So shall we begin with the main topic? So can you explain like, can you explain blockchain in a, in a layman's terms? So like, well, how would you explain blockchain to someone who's a non-tech person? I think, I think one thing I used to say was that um, you can think of like a blockchain as this, this massive uh, giant stone in the sky where you inscribe stuff, right? You just like carve words into it. Once you carve it in, you, it's very hard to erase without like, yeah, you just can't do it. Let's, let's just assume you can't erase like things that you put on stone, right? And that's, that's essentially what it is. So over time, you know, you accumulate more and more stuff on this stone and uh, everyone can see it. Yeah, that, that's the long and short of how to explain it, I guess. So that's the block, I guess? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the block and you use the chain to make sure nobody takes it away. Well, what blockchain does is um, it gives you complete transparency but it also gives you this um, ordering of transactions. Right? That, that, that's, that's, that's really the idea behind it. It's, it's a distributed ledger, like our name, distributed ledger technology. Right? It's a distributed ledger that anyone can access and um, anyone can write to it. Right? You just need to spend a little bit of the associated uh, currency. Like for Bitcoin, you spend Bitcoin. For Ethereum, you spend ETH. Right. So that's that. Um, blockchain is not a magic bullet. It's not something that you use to secure your 
IT systems. It's not firewall. It's not. It's not this. It's not encryption. Blockchain is definitely not encryption. It's a also another common misunderstanding. Blockchain is cryptographic, but blockchain is not encryption. Right. Um, blockchain is not anonymous. Right? People think that blockchain is anonymous, but blockchain is actually pseudonymous. So every transaction comes from a known wallet, like a, a address, right? Like you can think of it as usernames, that it's public. Right? And uh, everything that comes up from this username, everyone can know because it's completely public and transparent. Right? Um, it doesn't help you with confidentiality. And uh, yeah, so it, it actually, blockchain is not a lot of things. So what, what is blockchain? Uh, do you want to cover a bit about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, like I think I, I mentioned about it's, it's really like a time machine uh, or a ledger. Uh, and because of the fact that um, every block is, use the word chain or connected uh, through transitive hashing to the next block, then in order to tamper with any of the block, you need to change the block, um, previous block, which makes it kind of computationally almost impossible to tamper with. Um, so it's really like a time machine. Uh, that's why I, I use the word time machine as an analogy. And that's really a very, very niche. niche. Uh, that's why I say it's a very niche use of blockchain. And like what Arjun said, it's not a firewall that can block off uh, intruders, neither does it uh, chain your IT system. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's really a very niche use case for it. So earlier I said that blockchain is not encryption. So. Blockchain uses this uh, cryptography technique called uh, hashing. Right? What hashing does, you can think of it as when you mix two colors together, like you, when, you, when you do painting or coloring, right? you mix two colors together, what happens? They become a new color. You get a new color. But from this new color, can you tell what came before that? It's very, you, can't, you can't unmix the colors. It's very hard. In mathematical terms, we say it's a one-way one, uh, one function. Right? So you can't you can't uh, unmix it. So we, a lot of blockchain stuff is based on this hashing function, which means that when you have a new color, you can reproduce this, this new color if you know the previous colors. What does this mean? This means that the new color necessarily has to come after the previous colors. Right? And, and that establishes a causality. Right, and that, that's the, what, what the block in blockchains mean. Subsequent blocks have to be caused by the previous blocks. So that gives you an ordering of transactions. Uh, so you know that this data definitely came after this data. So for example, uh, I pay Steven first, and then Steven pays you. You know that the balance changes from this transaction first, and then from to that transaction. So that, that gives you a sense of, you know, roughly you, how to explain blockchain. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the fact that because it's distributed, uh, unlike uh, uh, you depend on a central trusted source, like for example, the banks, uh, that makes it computationally hard to, to change the order. Yeah. But that's the, the beauty of blockchain. What are the common use cases that we have for blockchain? Oh. What are the common use cases? Crypt crypto kitties? Crypto kitties, <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, what Steven says, crypto kitties, there was uh, quite fun project that came, I think, about one or two years ago uh, called CryptoKitties. Uh, what, what are CryptoKitties? It's like Pokemon, right? It's Pokemon on the blockchain. Yeah. Uh, you can like breed Pokemon and then take these and continue. It's collectibles, right? It's, it's like collectible trading cards. Mm -hmm. And the way it works is that people own these tokens, non-fungible tokens uh, on the blockchain. And it's just a fun thing. Uh. It, it doesn't really have to be like off any real use, but like the fact that this thing happened developed a lot of uh, technology, right? That wasn't there before. So that's, that often happens in, uh, in the tech sector. Like something just starts off as a toy. It's a, a game. It's a, something for people to play with. And then eventually, you know, people in the business will realize, hey, that's really similar to my use case. <laughs> so that's actually what happened. So we looked at CryptoKitties and we thought, hey, that's really similar to shipping where you have like ownership of cargo. So you own Pokemon, so now you own containers of goods instead. Not all that different. 
Yeah. And and the thing is, uh, maybe I elaborate a bit of what I meant, non fungible. So um, it's like, how do you make sure that uh, this item you own is 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 not is exclusive to you? It just belongs to you, uh, because in the physical space, when you have uh, you know something that is unique, like a art piece and, and all that. Uh, um, it's a lot harder. You still can replicate it, but it's just a lot, a lot harder. Hard piece. But then in the dig digital realm, it's in bits and bytes, on one and zeros, right? And it's just, you know, everybody can copy and paste and, and you know, duplicate that. Uh, so this technique of uh, creating non-fungible tokens uh, allow you to create something that's unique uh, in the digital realm. And this is why uh, we talk about CryptoKitties. And that's why, uh, because of this basis of uh, exclusiveness, creates some economic value, uh, or because it's limited edition, for example. And that actually lends itself well to trade trust, uh, because you do not want to devalue your bill of lading <laughs> by duplicating it and splitting it across many people, right? Yeah, so that's a good use case. Yeah, so that was uh, one of the use cases that may is maybe a bit better known, like, you know, owning things. So, so some examples of things that ha uh, blockchains have been used for as well, but maybe a bit less well-known, is uh, things like decentralized autonomous organizations. Right? They, they, these are, you can think of it as like a decentralized decision-making uh, method, which means that people don't need to be represented by other people. They can have a direct uh, effect on the outcome so the way this works is because when things are on the blockchain, it's completely public and viewable. And when you can inspect the code publicly, you know exactly what it does. So you can trust something that is on the blockchain because you know exactly what it will do. Right? So when it comes to these things, you, you trust that when you make a vote in something, it will necessarily affect the outcome in certain ways. So. Yeah, that's uh, decentralized, autonomized organizations. So another thing that uh, blockchain has been used for is uh, transparent funding al allocation. So there's this uh, project called Gitcoin. Um, it basically seeks to fund software projects, like open source software projects that uh, anyone can use. But you know, because it's open source, people tend to use open source software without paying for it because you know you can simply because it's all public access. So, but then, you know, software developers need to eat too, right? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes, maybe you don't. <laughs> I thought it was just coffee. <laughs> okay, but coffee still costs money. It still costs money. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you can't buy coffee, like, for free. Right? So, you know, when you have um, something like Gitcoin, people know that because the code is viewable, transparent and all, when you donate or you put some money into these uh, organizations, this fund, you know how it will be allocated, right? It can be allocated based on something called like quadratic funding, for example, which is what Gitcoin uses. That's a topic for another day. But, you know, it's transparent. That's the whole point of it. Like you put money in, you know where it will go. Unlike, you know, sometimes you donate to charities and you're like, uh, what do they use the money for? Mm, not sure I agree with that. Wait, how much do they pay their people again? <laughs> so, you know, when you have things like Gitcoin, it's all transparent. Anyone can see where all the money goes, right? So that's a good use case. Mm, what other things? Censor censorship resistance. So, because uh, blockchain is decentralized, you can have... It's very hard to censor. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. Some people... You know, people on both sides of the fence, right? So, yeah, so when you put something on a blockchain, it's very easy to transfer it without it being blocked because you can verify what is in it. Whereas with traditional um, internet mediums, I mean, you, sure, you can use like a public key infrastructure, but in the first place, you need to know who you can trust, right? So that's that. And maybe I can touch on one last thing is that um, domain names that don't require a central authority. So... Actually, DNS is like domain name system. It's, it's one of the technologies that is really decentralized relatively compared to uh, most other technologies. But 
even then, it's still reliant on uh, the ICANN, right? I forgot what ICANN stands for, but it's, it's this central body that administers like the domain name systems. But with um, blockchain, there's actually this thing called uh, Ethereum name service. And this does not re rely on a central body. I mean, the smart contracts, you can look at them and see what they do. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you think about uh, election? Use, use blockchain for, for election. Yeah. <laughs> very, very spicy, like, don't trouble me. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, been, I've been thinking about it for quite a while. You know, technology is already here. It can be done, but uh, I think it's going to be a very hard, uh, hard sell or to convince people how it works. And in the end of introducing technology just to for the sake of it, uh, it, may, it may create a lot of uh, distrust, right? Yeah, so actually I've talked about this a lot with my colleague Raymond. Right? He's my partner in uh, DLT. Partner in crime. In crime. <laughs> in crime and in good. <laughs> right. So, yes, you can achieve a better technological outcome yeah. with uh, blockchain and cryptography. But in the end, voting is about the will of the people. And it needs to be something that people understand. It's, it's very easy to understand how voting works right now. Yeah, uh, that. Even, even if you can't read, you can understand what voting is. Yeah. Whereas if you try to introduce like complicated technological solutions, then like you said, distrust happens. Yeah, exactly. It will backfire. Yeah. Hmm. So, hmm. so yeah, that I mean, te this technology is fascinating because it's nascent, it's new. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, called greenfield uh, opportunities to to apply, uh, but again, um, have to use it judiciously. Uh, for whatever reason, like. It may not be the best use uh, with regards to that problem on hand. And sometimes it also may not be the right time as well, a uh, bit because of social acceptance. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah. But again, this space is evolving very, very fast. Uh, do you remember that time when we were um, we we basically when we use Ethereum, we have to incur the gas fee, right? Right to and then with the uh, at that, at that time, I think the price the price was quite manageable, but I think these days it's, it's crazy high, right? Ridiculously high, and we managed to figure out a, a better way to write um, using um, we call it DID VC, yeah. So, but this is this is again an example of how fast the landscape this technology is is moving, and we are always uh, that's a fun part I think about technology. It's always learning, mm -hmm. yeah. And people are always trying to solve problems, like if. The fun part about open source is that you know, you know that you're not the only one trying to solve the problem. Yeah. <laughs> so just now, uh, when we introduced ourselves, um, you talked about uh, open certs and like trade trust. So what is open certs? Open certs was our very first uh, project with uh, this technology. Like, you know, because when you start, you have to start somewhere. Right? And open source was a very easy place to start with because uh, there was actually already a uh, a school that was working on it, like uh, Nian Poly was working on it real early. They were real early in the game, right? even before we, before I even know what blockchain is. Right? So they started on this early with a company, and um, unfortunately, that didn't work out for them because the, they couldn't quite get the execution correct. It was very early days, so everything was new, and you have to try a lot of times when things are new. Like you try and fail many times. That's how new technologies start. Right, so um, it was easy for us because number one, we already had a partner right, with uh, Nian Poly. Um, and technologically wise, it was very simple because open source yeah. is ed educational credentials digitalized. Right. Yeah, so something like a digital cert where you can verify online using uh, blockchain technology. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's what it is. Right. Um, yeah, so it was easy to, to get started with because the technology is very simple. You just basically have to get people to issue certs and proof that they did. So there's there's no there's no complexity to it. They just have to issue a short string that says uh, I issued this at what time. The paper said you can lose it very easily and you have to pay money to get a copy. You can't even get an original. <laughs> you have to pay some amount for administration fees because you're causing trouble to people. Right? <laughs> Generally you have to pay money when it costs you trouble. So yeah, so with OpenSearch, it's digital, and um, you can easily prove that every copy is the same as what was issued. So essentially, every copy is original. 
because it's exactly the same as original, right? So that that's nice. And what else is nice about it is that you can store all these copies in whatever medium you want to store it in. You can put it in a floppy disk if you want, if you can, right? But I mean, I don't think anyone's done that so far. <laughs> but yeah, you can store it in your Dropbox. You can store it in your email. You can put it on a thumb drive. You can do anything you want with it. And it's easy to retrieve because you can always use Control F if you don't know where you left it, right? So yeah, with paper copies, you have to like keep it safe and remember where you kept it and make sure it doesn't burn up in a fire or something. Yeah, things like that. So Stephen, can you still find your open certs now? Like, like how, how do I find my open certs or how do I, how do I retrieve it? Uh, I mean, for you, you are currently studying in NUS. So the moment you graduate, you will definitely receive your, a copy of open cert. As far as I know, uh, since I think two, three years ago, when we first started uh, MOE, uh, all the all the students, graduating students from polys and you know ITEs and universities, they are receiving uh, open certs by default. Yeah. JCs too. And uh, JCs too, yeah, JCs too, uh, even O level as well. I think the yeah, and they are going to retrospectively issue for the past ten years. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm probably too old for that. <laughs> Actually, I think you probably can find yours on um, this this app called My Skills Future. Uh, the mobile app is called My Skills Future, and uh, it's under the Skills Passport section. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let's say I have I have my digital cert, right? So what what, what am I going to do with it next? Oh, you can apply the GovTech. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one great option. You can apply the GovTech with it. <laughs> Uh, what else can you do with it? You can put it on the screen and put it up on the frame in your home, wallpaper. perhaps. <laughs> or you can use it as a wallpaper on your laptop. Uh, okay, those are not very useful uses. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, generally in Singapore, I think we've gotten enough publicity out there that almost everyone, or maybe not almost everyone, some people, many people would have heard of it. And even if they don't want to do with it, um, there's a very helpful email that goes out with it that tells you how to use it. Okay, sounds good. I think I think the best use of it is when um, you want to go overseas to further your studies, and then the, the education institutions and overseas they will you know need all these documents. So this is a very good use of that as well. Yeah, so that's the benefit of blockchain, right? Where you can uh, sort of verify the certs online, or uh, where overseas colleges can verify the certs online. Independent. To, yeah, independently. Yeah, so like moving on from open certs to trade trust, right? So that's a big difference in industry. Maybe you wanna explain like how, how we got there and what trade trust is. Trade trust, it's actually not that different. You think it's, it sounds like completely different, but honestly, where you have paper, it's all the same. When you're turning paper to bits and bytes, right? So in trade trust, what we're doing is we are digitalizing trade documentation. All right. So, for example, certificate of origins, uh, bill of ladings, all this a lot of paperwork that has to go with trade. So, why why paper has like maintained such a strong foothold in our modern world is because paper is universal. You don't need to install software to use paper. You can just take it and you look at it with your eyes. All right. You can touch it. You can feel it. And it feels real, looks real, probably real, <laughs> hopefully real. If it's not real, you can sue the other person. <laughs> All right. So that, that's why paper has maintained such a strong flow, right? And what we're trying to do is to create like digital versions of these um, paper things, you know, to for all the previously mentioned benefits. You can transmit them instantly instead of having to wait for it to show up. So like, you know, sometimes bill of ladings arrive slower than the shipments that, you know, they accompany. Yeah, so the, the ships is locked up in the Singapore Harbour, right? Or something like that? Uh, sometimes things just happen and paper travels faster than goods sometimes and sometimes goods travel faster than paper. So it's, it's all this friction, right? Like with digital stuff, there's a lot less friction. Things happen a lot faster in the di digital world than the physical world. And that that's what the benefits of trying to introduce this uh, digitalization to trade document does. Mm, and, and to add this, you're right, it's mostly the same technology-wise between uh, trade trust and 
open source. But there's some uh, differences. I think the non fungible token part, I think that's one of the key differences where you you create trust, we need to make sure it, it prevent the double spending problem. Unlike a, a educational cert, you can share many people, but you want to make sure that uh, your trade document only belongs to one person at any point in time, to prevent double spending. Uh, another difference is more on the economics of it, the, the impact it, it, it brings, right, compared to education, because the stakes are so much, so much higher in, in trade compared to in, in education. Uh, in, in terms of economic value, right? Because whoever holds that bit of lending owns that, you know, the goods and all that. So that's one. Number two, um, uh, it has been said that the cost of um, shipping and all that, about ten to twenty percent of it is attributed to all this uh, paperwork and all that, all this stuff. And paperwork is very hard to automate because it's physical paper. But once you make it digital, then you notice that. Uh, a lot of more possibilities will come can come in because it's become machine readable and automation can, can take place. Trade trust is because of the stakes involved. Uh, so IMD has done a really good job with the recent uh, ETA, the Electronic Transaction Act, so that uh, legislatively we we actually recognize this uh, trade trade document uh, that's been digitalized. Yeah. So I guess now that we have talked about uh, the DLT team's main two projects. Like, is there any like other use cases that you guys are thinking about, or any other projects that you guys are working about that you can share with us? I may have heard of the health certs uh, that's been announced by Minister Vivian. Um, so that is uses the same technology, uh, similar technology as open certs. Underlying it is called open attestation. It's a document notarization framework that we use um, to authenticate and then to endorse, right, to basically to sign it. On it. Uh, so health cert is one similar use case as open cert, but instead of in the educational certificate, we are applying the same technology to medical data, which is to be more specific, uh, COVID test result, uh, as well as uh, vaccination cert. Uh, slight differences is more on the data schema, they are different. Um, and then the impact again, because in this case, it's really to um, help with safe travel. And a lot of countries are trying to figure out what does it, what does vaccinate, you know, person who's vaccinated, what does it mean, uh, and mean as in, in terms of uh, whether it be reduced like quarantine period and all that. These are all still still in the works. Nobody knows, but uh, for that to work, then there needs to be a way to really verify that uh, the the certificate, right, the vac vaccination cert and the pre departure test, uh, which PCR test, is not. Temp, it's not temper, it's not doctored. Because there have been a lot of all these cases out there uh, in the news where instead of somebody going to spend like 200 plus bucks for a PCR test, they can spend like $20 just for a fix it. Economics wise, it's, it's no brainer, right? Um, so these are all the various, I'll call it, um, pretty good use case of um, blockchain or maybe I should, I should use the word open attestation at the library that we developed for, for this, this kind of use case. Uh, which have a impact not just in terms of education uh, but also in terms of the economic which is trade trust as well as, well as public health for health certs. So you mentioned the project about uh, health certs right like what are some of the steps that you take that, that you mentioned previously to sort of uh, to, to, to get it going you know? Oh um, so at the end of the day uh, Technology is a, merely a means to solve a problem. So the problem has to be well articulated or maybe before articulated, well understood. Right? So for the case of health cert, uh, for, um, fortunately we have very good uh, people in, in MOH and uh, they, they approach us because they know about what we did for open source and all that. And then they are trying to figure out if we can do the same for COVID test result. So the challenge we face is that uh, when our traveler go to other country, uh, the other country, they will want to check the, the certificate, the PCR test certificate, and they're not sure whether it's legit or not. And then they often have to call ICA and call you know uh, MOH and all. It incur a lot of uh, administrative burden on them. So this is the first first order problem. And so it's how to digitize and how many digitize and how do the you know receiving country verify it? Right? Um, so we basically show them what we have done for open certs and we say, yeah, actually this is actually a pretty good match. Um, for health certs as well, and to do the same. 
but not so much of everything the same. Like I said, the, the tough part is more on the, the field, right? Because in education, you want to ensure your transcripts and whatnot, and not. But in health, then it's more sensitive. So in the end, uh, a lot of time is spent on what are the fields to collect, all right, and what standards to use. Because if you just put the date, time, right, on the health cert, right, in for example PCR test. Uh, and then the receiving country will actually ask, is it this date time, is it the date time of issuance or is it date times of the test uh, you know, or the visit? So it has to be more specificity, right? Even worse, they might ask, wait, is this the month or the year? Oh, or yeah. the, the month or the day? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> These yeah. are the things that you have to establish, right? Yeah. The common data understanding. Correct. So we actually look, look at what is out there. So we adopted the um, F... HIR, the standard, so there's a there's a standard for medical documents, how they want the nomenclature of the fields and all that uh, use and health cert. And so we work very closely with them on, on that coming of the schema and then use open attestation. And then the, hard, the harder part is more on um, do we want to, uh, when do you want to centralize and when do you want to decentralize the issuance? Uh, and it took a while because uh, initially when we were um, beefing or ramping up our pre-departure test, not pre but PCR test, uh, there's lack of such capability, uh, the, the actual test, right? So a lot of it is, is centralized in public hospitals and all that. But then as we need to scale, it has to go beyond that, uh, engage the private sector help, right? Uh, medical institutions help with the PCR test. And then it comes, the question comes, okay, now people want to use it for travel, right? Does it still make sense to fund by taxpayers' money or centrally funded? Maybe it's, it does it may not make much sense. So maybe if you want to privatize that, because people should ought to pay for for their own PCR test if they want to travel instead of using taxpayers' money. Then it becomes a lot clearer. Then why we choose the current model of a decentralized issuance, um, and when you talk about decentralized issuance, then the thing is, should a government okay, a technology we can decentralize, but should a government really go and help the private clinics and all that? Uh, and if not, then what is a better way? Then we realize that actually we should just let the market solve his own problem uh, by, uh, again, like what we did for open search, right? Provide a technology for private sector to play. So we have actually, as of now, we have nine, sorry, 10, as of now, 10 health search providers uh, servicing um, nine countries, uh, issuing health search for, uh, for medical institutions across uh, nine countries. And because they, there's, there's uh, commercial in incentives for that, for them, for them to do it. We provide a code base for free, technology for free, they take it, monetize it, and help medical institutions with the issuance. Uh, so in a way, I, I personally think that this is a very really good way of uh, demonstrating how public-private partnership should be. All right? uh, beyond just uh, providing grants and assistance helping the private players, we can actually provide technology that they can use it to, to monetize uh, and also bring it to other countries as well. Uh, so yeah, that's that's uh, in a nutshell how it came about, who we work with, and how it actually gradually evolved until the current state. And then now, uh, if you talk about moving forward uh, for vaccination, set, right? The vaccine supply is, is limited, so it's it's unlikely that uh, we're going to privatize it. It has to be very very tightly controlled. So it will be a cent centralized issuance, right? Uh, but who knows when we have enough supply, right? Because if you look at normal flu shot, you know that it's not, you know, it's not centrally, you know, administered. It's, it's privatized. So I believe that eventually, when we will reach a stage where it be privatized, and then it can be a decentralized uh, issuance as well and administered as well. So actually, a lot of things to think about. Yeah, de definitely. And um, technology is 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 um is a is a means to an end. Like I said, important thing is not to force fit the technology, but really understand the problem we're trying to solve, really understand the different stakeholders, not just MOH, but the different players, private medical institution, uh, the partners who wants to use our technology to monetize and want to verify it, and what are their incentives, and how do we position the, our, the technology in a way that uh, doesn't go against the natural inclination of, of humans and businesses. I see. Oh. So, um, are there any like challenges like for the uptake of this um, this technology, like, do you foresee any maybe major challenges that we need to overcome before this becomes mainstream? It's 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 the case with like new technologies. So it's like uh, getting adoption is hard because it's number one, nobody knows about it, right? And when nobody knows about it, how do you even put together a team? 
you can't you can't put together a team when you have nobody who knows about it, right? So, and then there's the part with uh, being in government. It's it's the case that you know government is not in the business of uh, making risky bets. Uh, government is not a venture capital, right? <laughs> it's, it's, we, we, we have to be a bit more conservative. So like when you adopt new technology, no one putting together a team is hard. Um, you have to find suitable use cases because it has to be profitable. Maybe, maybe profitable is the wrong word. It has to at least bring some benefits, right? Not in terms of money, but maybe in t- terms of man hours save or reducing friction. Um, Improving the state of things, like we, we can't just like throw money away just you know to play with new technologies. That's just not that's not a thing we can do, right? So you have to convince people that you know a project is worthy. Uh, you have to put together a team. You can't just like snap your fingers and say, "Oh, this is a good use case. I would like to get twenty headcounts to work on this." That doesn't work. <laughs> it's probably going to take like at least three months, you know, just to sort out like writing everything up correctly. So that's, that's a new technology adoption. Then there's the part where you need to build up your team. I mean, even when you hire like senior developers, when it comes to new technology, they don't come with the skill set necessary to work in this space because it's just quite esoteric, right? So, I mean, we've come up some ways. Uh, OpenSearch is about two years plus old now. Um, when I started, I didn't know anything about blockchain. That was two years ago, <laughs> right? And I mean, if you ask me if doing anything was very possible at all, I mean, it would have been probably a no because I just didn't have any skills in this, right? And then, okay, now I know something about blockchain. Now I need to hire people who know about blockchain or at least hire people who can learn about blockchain. And that, that all takes time, right? So now we've got a steady team. That's why we managed to do a health search in, what, three months? Less than. Most of it was sorting out non-tech stuff. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I mean, when, when it comes to new technology, there's, there's no, like, you just can't make projects magically appear. It, it takes time. I think that the, the biggest challenge is really the, like what RJ said, because it's new. People don't have a good mental model of what is it. Um, I mean, for engineers, I mean, yeah, they can they can pick it up. They know what is cryptography and they know what is uh, transitive ha- hashing and and whatnot. Uh, but for the non-tech folks, uh, it's a lot harder for them to understand because it's a pretty strange, weird, uh, esoteric, uh, very different mental model of of how to do how to track data or make sure it's demo proof. People start to be uh, a lot more skeptical about the technology, when you say people like you know, stakeholders and all that. Uh, and it starts to harder for people to tell what is the, uh, to separate the wheat from the chaff. Lah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's difficult. And we are very, very fortunate uh, that um, we have got strong support from the senior leadership uh, that they requested us to take a look at this technology. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're really, really, really fortunate. And at the same time, there was not uh, a lot of pressure for us to like um, just deliver something just for the sake of doing. And yeah, because sometimes I see uh, other companies or you know whatever entities, uh, they, they just want to jump on the, this bandwagon of the hype, right? And they just want to do something on blockchain just for the sake of it, even though the use case is very, very weak and doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, so I'm we're very fortunate. Then we can actually really pick and choose uh, the appropriate use case. Uh, like I said, this technology is new and nascent, and very it fits a very niche uh, um, use case. So it's it's not a really general purpose tool that you can use it to apply for a lot of other things. And um, that's why if I were to if I were to look at what is out there uh, in terms of the use case of blockchain, most of it uh, doesn't really need a blockchain. Really, yeah. Apart from that, um, one of the challenge, another challenge of uh, using this technology is because of the misalignment of interests. A lot of time, the data provider, or in this case, a health cert issuer or education cert issuer, they will have to incur the work, right? 
uh, of issuing it with this new technology. Uh, and the benefit is being reaped by the downstream, people who needs to verify. Uh, so there's a bit of a misalignment of uh, interest as well. Um, that makes the adoption a lot, a lot harder. Uh, but fortunately, thanks to this, uh, you know, COVID, you know, say that don't miss a good crisis. Um, then there's a lot more impetus because uh, it's on a burning platform. People are a lot more bold to to adopt this technology because they they do see the the benefit of it. So blockchain sounds interesting. It sounds specialized. Well, how do I become a blockchain developer? It's a both easy and difficult to answer question. Right. In terms of like hard skills, it's a hard question to answer because it's it's such a new field, right? I don't think there's necessarily a very well-defined syllabus of what you need to learn to become a blockchain developer. But I think what is definitely needed in terms of skills is that you need to be able to uh, understand new things quickly. There's a lot of reading involved yes, because things are changing every day. You, you always have to keep up with what's Change since yesterday, even all right. So, yeah, you have to be passionate about the technology as well because it's it's a difficult thing to use because everything is like public and transparent. That that really limits what you can do. Like you can't just put everything on the blockchain. Yeah, number one, that will cost you billions of dollars, right? <laughs> number two, that will cause a huge privacy issue, right? Because everything is visible. So yeah, how to become a blockchain developer? Just Passion and curiosity, and uh... yeah, I, I mean, in fact, we should ask you instead because since you joined us right, as an intern, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not sure about your, your uh, before you joined us. Do you have any blockchain experience? <laughs> yeah, so funny story. So um, actually, when I when I when I first heard about blockchain, it was when I was preparing for the interview uh, with RJ <laughs> over here. Yeah, so. Um, like, I knew I was going to join the DLT team. And I was like, oh, what is DLT, right? So a quick Google will tell you that it's distributed ledger tech. So I was like, what's that? Then I realized that, oh, wait, it's blockchain. Yeah. So I think um, my first encounter with blockchain was really um, when I was preparing for the interview. So I went to read up uh, and watch some YouTube videos on like uh, what basically blockchain was and how it worked. Yeah. And I think um, before the interview, like RJ also sent some uh, materials on like how to code in Solidity. I think there was this uh, very fun tutorial website uh, called Crypto Zombies. It's something like Crypto Kitties, but it teaches you how to code it. Yeah. So uh, I sort of tried it out and I realized that like, oh, that's something that I find, uh, I find quite interesting and quite enjoyable to do. So I decided to carry on to go for this interview with RJ. So during the interview, I think like RJ sort of asked me a few technical questions. Yeah. He also sort of explained that like, Actually, to join the DLT team, you don't really need to be a blockchain expert, yeah, per se. But um, all you have to do is to, to be curious and to be willing to learn. Uh, in fact, like, there are other roles as well that, uh, that I can fill up besides the smart contract developer role. So perhaps like, you can do some back-end or you can do uh, front-end development. Uh, you just need to understand the technology, how it works and its limitations. So I thought uh, the team was quite welcoming and so I decided to join and learn on the job. So I think like the past uh, six months that I've inter interned with the team, uh, it was quite enjoyable. And so I decided that like uh, in my schooling, like what I'm schooling now, I decided to take a mod in blockchain to sort of uh, pick up all where I left off uh, after the intern ended. Yeah. Justice did a really good job like coming from not knowing blockchain. So uh, by the end of it, he was definitely an expert at blockchain in just a short six months. Mm -hmm. right? And actually, not even if if you're not a software developer, you can still like participate in this technology. Like for example, we have other roles on the team such as a UX designer, right, and a product owner, right. So these people they don't code. They're, they're not software engineers. I mean, maybe they do in their free time, but probably not, <laughs> right. So, like, it's the same like when you're a designer for a normal software project. You, you don't need to understand exactly how a database works inside. You just need to know what it can do. How do you design like user interfaces around that, workflows around that. You know, you don't need to know. It's, it's, you can think of it the same way. It doesn't, you don't need to understand how the database works. You don't need to understand intimately how the blockchain works. I mean, it's good to have somebody on the team who knows it, right? Because then he can explain to the rest like what the limitations are, what you can do with it, and keep up with all the latest things. You know, but you don't have to be a programmer necessarily. 
Yeah, the most important thing is to have an open and curious mind. Yeah, as, yeah. So over uh, over here, we often share articles, uh, reading materials, and and we also write write blogs as well. I think that's that's helpful to crystallize our thoughts. Yeah, so you can check out you can check out Stephen's um, blog, okay, <laughs> JDS on uh, JDS GovTech, right on Medium. Yeah, so I read some of his articles. I find them quite interesting as well. And we're always hiring, so feel free to join us. Thank you for watching this episode of Tech Away. So if you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share the video with your like-minded friends. So if there's a topic that you'd like to hear us talk about next, you can leave a comment down below and we'll take a look at it. So in the meantime, you can also continue to learn more about GovTech and the impactful projects we work on via our digital and social media channels. Also, if you are keen on a career opportunity with GovTech, visit our career website at go.gov.sg slash govtechcareers. So thank you and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.